Hello. Uh, I'll just set myself up so I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> this is a video about essential oils inhalation. And it came about because I attended an Aroma Summit, the Aroma Summit, hosted by the Aroma Trust at the weekend. And I attended a lecture where I, where I heard a lovely lady called Sue saying she was training to be an aromatherapist, but her friends kind of looked at her in disbelief. Aromatherapy, isn't that just like when things smell nice? And she was like, I don't know what to say to them. And I get it. I really do get it. And so this is an area that I've researched a lot over the years. I'm a, a, a big advocate of essential oil inhalation over topical administration of, of aromatherapy. In other words, sniffing your oils rather than needing to put them on your skin. And so this is an old lecture that I um, delivered, I think, about two years ago. And the arrogance that I haven't rehearsed it before I come on uh, video, but I thought I would show this to you in case there are any other aromatherapists out there who are having the same problem. Bit of a nervousness about saying to people, sniff that oil. So without further ado, let's see if I can share my screen. Of course, it's not the screen I wanted. That's always the way, isn't it? Bear with me a second. Try again, scratch screen, here it is. And let's put it back here. So just before we go on to everything, let me explain who I am in case you don't know me. My name is Elizabeth Ashley. I am the Secret Healer. I am the UK Director of the National Association of Holistic Aromatherapy, and I have been an um, overseas speaker for the International Federation of Aromatherapists. I am an essential oil researcher. I write books about essential oils, which I've written 23 under the name um, The Secret Healer, and you can find those on Amazon. Incidentally, I'll put um, in the description my link tree so you can find out all of those details and find my books easily from there so this what are we going to cover in this video we're going to talk about what we know about how inhalation affects us what are the different processes that into uh, that uh, inhalation touches and what do they do we will talk a small about uh, amount about the sense of smell itself but we're going to really concentrate mainly on the theoretical ramifications of what we know. Um, and the reason why I say that is because of all the senses, and we talk about five, don't we? We talk about touch, sight, hearing um, and taste. But there are other senses, you know, like a sense of balance, sense of beauty. So they're not the only ones, but of the five main ones that we talk about in our particular culture, Scent and smell is the one that is researched the least. And the reason for that is because in the Middle Ages up to the 18th century, religion really put a big bias on if it was smelt good, it was godly. And if it smelt bad, it was of the devil. It was malevolent. And so people were very scared to actually really enter into the ideals of the sense of smell. So we really, as a, an industry, we're quite retarded from that point of view that we've been held back by people's belief systems. But now it's really exploding, but we're only at the beginnings of understanding. And so the things that we understand, what could they come to mean in terms of therapy, in terms of um, being able to make drugs uh, in the future? We're going to talk a bit about nerve signaling. Now, the reason why that's important to me is I teach uh, people to become pain practitioners. Um, and the sense of smell can have a real strong bearing on how much we perceive we are in pain. And so we'll talk a little bit about that because the smell can really uh, make a difference on um, somebody who's suffering from pain a lot on their day to day ways of living. Then we'll talk a bit about some of the experiments that have proven aromatherapy's effects. And then 
a very quick uh, synopsis of what oils did what. Incidentally, there are uh, links. So if you can stop your video, you will be able to see the links that I am referring to, to be able to look at them if you wanted to. Um, so before we go any further, though, I really want to think about this particular statistic. Um, it's not necessarily related to inhalation per se, but I think it really can have a bearing on um, how important this kind of work can be. So women's sexual dysfunction is really underexplored. There's not very much money allocated to it in, in government bu budgets. And so things like PMS, things like menopause, things like sexual dysfunction are ignored. Um, but statistically, it's proven that nearly 70% of the effectiveness of treatment for people who are for women who are suffering from sexual dysfunction comes from placebo. In other words, simply having somebody listen to them and offering them something that may help them does help them. Three quarters of the time almost, it will be um they will be helped just by giving them a bottle of oil and saying smell that now add to that an oil that is known to work on women's sexual function like jasmine like rose like neroli and then you are sailing home aren't you so you really want to stress to you the importance of listening to your patient and making them feel validated about their concerns because it might not be uh, a huge societal problem that that woman has got uh, is suffering from vaginal dryness, but to her, it's the centre of her world. So listen to her. And yeah, then think about your oils. So we're going to be talking about olfaction, aren't we? And olfaction is breathing essential oils. So we have two main avenues, don't we, of how um, essential oils go into the nervous system the first is breathing up the nose and as we can see it goes up to the olfactory bulb which is then has lots of lots of nerves um, taking information up and then the olfactory bulb goes right into the brain which we can see in the middle part of the slide and it's um perfectly positioned within a structure that I'm sure many of you will know about, the limbic system, which is a really old structure which is involved in learning, memory, cognition, appetite, mood. So as we smell, those oil molecules have the perfect way of getting into there. And Within this olfactory bulb that we can see on the left hand side of the screen, actually that picture makes it look a little bit bigger than it is. It's around about the size of a dime or a five pence piece if you're from my neck of the woods. And uh, within that there are around about 100,000 uh, little receptors that take information through. And What's interesting is, of course, it can the brain can recognize around about three million different fragrances. But how does it do that with around about 100,000 receptors? Well, the answer to that is the receptors have almost like little channels and the brain registers how they vibrate against it and then signals them off to different places. So different molecules go on different receptors and different receptors may also um, acknowledge several different fragrances and they'll take the messages of those into the limbic system and you can see some of the structures that are in the limbic system so for example we can see the hypothalamus the um the the amygdala which it's not marked on here but the pituitary gland as well is part of it and this is very much involved in stress uh the the amygdala which we can see at the at the bottom of the picture perceives fear and if it perceives fear then it will send messages to the hypothalamus to say tell the guys stuff's coming the hypothalamus sends messages to the pituitary gland that sets out hormones hormones go to the um, adrenal gl glands and the adrenals go stress hormone send it right through the body so this cascade 
is very fast and cortisol in its own right, the stress hormone, one of the stress hormones, is actually quite healthy on a small level basis um, because it has an anti-inflammatory nature so that it will pull away resources from the limbs and the skin and all of the things that are not vital to getting you jumping up a tree out of the way of the saber tooth tiger that's coming your way. But of course, biologically, we're wired to switch everything off when the saber saber tooth tiger's gone. Either somebody shoots it or it gets hungry and goes somewhere else. It's going. But deadlines don't disappear. Worries about money don't disappear. All of those things that stress us today, but also add to that um, the the surges that we get from um, checking in on social media, all of those things that is repetitive stress, it can't switch it off. Um, And we need a a structure called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex to say, do you know what? Stop. Now, the problem with the prefrontal frontal cortex is it goes after a while I'm going to read the paper you're not listening to a word I say and so after a while what we have is the amygdala going send out stress send out stress send out stress continually with nothing to turn it off when that happens cortisol becomes inflammatory not anti-inflammatory as it was it turns on its axis we have in, uh, um, a fl- an inflammatory uh, nature so we will have inflammatory in the um, in the joints pain uh, skin problems anger you know all of those things that we see from uh, inflammation uh, partly comes from the from the prefrontal cortex reading this paper <laughs> So essentials are a really good way of intervening and saying to the amygdala, calm down. And once we can settle that down, lots of them will also interact with the hypothalamus and with the hippocampus, which deals with memory, as well as other things, appetite and things. Um, So when we breathe, Uh, essential oils we breathe them up our nose but we also breathe them through our mouth don't we part of the molecules go through the mouth and when you are as square as I am you get very excited about certain trials and certain molecules and beta caryophylline is my favorite molecule this is a tremendous trial that really shows cleverly how um far a molecule can go so this is a mouse that we've uh, we've tested on here but the ma- the mices the mices were given were had like a uh, beta caryophylline beta caryophylline blown into their surroundings so they were breathing it in and after they were exposed to it they were sacrificed sorry and cut up sorry but we were able to find out that the beta caryophylline was it's in its lungs it was in its olfactory bulb it was in its brain its blood serum its heart its liver its kidneys its epidemal fat and the brown adipose tissue which is your fat basically it was also found in the liver and 24 hours after still there a day later it was in the liver the brain and the fat um and this incidentally the reason why we're talking about fat in this one is because they were trying to ascertain how useful it would be for helping people with diabetes um so it says the indic the results indicate that the molecule would have been distributed into the brain via the blood circulation In other words, that they had breathed it in, it had gone through the the capillaries of the lungs, right the way through into the blood system, the blood system, and they'd circulated it to all parts of the body, including the brain. And it says here, um, in addition to the lung pathway, direct distribution into the nasal cavity may also be considered as a potential distribution pathway to the brain. In other words, please don't snort it 
but just inhaling it will take it to the brain. And we know that sesquiterpenes in particular, lots of terpenes, but particularly sesquiterpenes are proven to pass between and across the blood brain barrier. So this trial in 2018 talked about how essential oils actually work. How do they work? when you inhale them. And they were able to prove that the, uh, the molecules within the essential oils themselves targeted two particular um, areas. The first was the GABAergic si um, system, and the second was the sodium um, channels. And we'll look at what those are in a minute. But these two areas were the main areas pinpointed as how they will now go forward to help people use essential oils for neurological diseases. And by that, I mean things like Parkinson's, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, um, depression, anxiety, all of those things. So let's think about GABA first of all. Do we know what GABA is? So within the nervous system, there are two, uh, well, there's lots of different parts of the nervous system, but we have like the electrical nervous system that sends electricity backwards and forwards to the limbs, to the brain. But we also have the chemical ner um, nervous system. So what we have is gaps between the nerves and the way that the message gets from here to here, the electricity won't go through. So chemicals are dispatched. And the main inhibitory neurotransmitter is GABA. So, in, so glutamate excites the system, GABA inhibits it. And glutamate, again, another one that needs a good press officer, really good for getting us out of the bed, uh, um, you know, motivating us, getting us going in the morning. But again, if we're not careful, it goes out of control. So we need GABA to bring it down. What we'll find is... Uh, if if somebody's suffering from from stress, but also anxiety or fear or seizures, all of those things are associated with problems with GABA. So essential oils that affect GABA are able to help these areas to soothe anxiety, to calm fear, to settle down stress, and hopefully, if we're lucky, to stop seizures. And then we talked about the ion channels, didn't we? So these are uh, more physical, if you like, than the mental. The, the uh, GABA is, is, of course, chemical, but it's to do with the, the um, emotional and mental bodies more than anything else. But the sodium ion channels are to do with physical stuff. So I like this picture. It always reminds me of hair grips. So these hair grips on it are actually a cell wall. And the blue bits are the gateway in and out of the cell. So what we see here, the red dots that look like the Smarties that send the kids loopy, they are sodium. And so as you can see, the sodium the, on the left, the open gate allows the sodium to come in and out. And so what essential oil constituents can do, some of them, is to help these work better to say open more often, don't open so, uh, so often. And by doing so, they help to regulate the things that sodium ion channels regulate, which are blood volume, blood pressure, fluid retention, acidity in the body. So again, don't forget this is not topical. This is not topical usage, I should say, because that was a misleading statement. This is inhalation. So that says, by inhaling an essential oil, we can influence the sodium ion channels and affect acidity in the body. And we can affect fluid retention. So what would we use? I guess um, fluid retention, I'd be looking at juniper, I would be looking at fennel, I would be looking at cypress, all of those things that I would have used topically. I'm going to try using in, uh, inhalation first because they're going on this, uh, the same kind of avenues. So we have this dynamic relationship. The sodium channels are in the body. 
the GABA is within the nervous system and they're helping each other to talk to each other and it's executed through the brain and essential oils. So this is more technical stuff, but I think it's really important to know. We've talked about how GABA is responsible for things like um, anxiety, fear, stress, seizures. Well, what's really interesting is the neurons within the body, the olfactory neurons specifically, those nerves to do with smelling things, actually express GABA. In other words, the more you exercise those olfactory neurons to smell things, you will encourage the body to express GABA. And this is mediated by another neurotransmitter, which is serotonin. And serotonin is a master of all trades. It's involved in around about 300 different processes, including mood modulation and uh, keeping the gut calm because 90% of serotonin is in the gut. So very, very important to IBS, for example. And so these two respond to, uh, to essential oils, in particular, lavender and lemon. They will really support serotonin, which will help to mediate and express GABA. And in some cases, the cells co-express. So not only will they uh, make GABA but, or serotonin, they'll make oxytocin or dopamine. But what we're seeing here, and imagine the best sort of context of saying it, is somebody who has depression will often talk about how life seems very grey. What happens is this inhalation of essential oils brings us into glorious technicolour. You know, we're suddenly more motivated. We're suddenly more excited about life. We're happier. We're getting more joyful because we're feeling things more acutely. Um, and yeah, all can be mediated using essential oils through inhalation. So evidence then. So anxiety. Well, again, if you were on the... Um, Aroma Summit the other day, you will have heard Mark Webb and da uh, Daniel Penuel talking about the need to get rid of functional groups as a training um, facility, or actually them saying, actually, that's nonsense to do that. And this is really interesting because it says that of 20 compounds derived from essential oils, um, interestingly, two thirds of them were either alcohols or terpenes. So those saying that it's nonsense, well, straight away we say, but yeah, we kind of know <laughs> because there either seem to be alcohols or terpenes. So therefore there's, um, you know, justice for keeping that, um, that going as a teaching um, aid. So these um, anxiolytic compounds, Incidentally, tested on rodents, these anxiolytic compounds tend to be monoamine uh, neurotransmitters, which we just talked about, serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline. They seem to interact with amino acid um, neurotransmitters, glutamate and GABA, and that HPA access that we talked about right at the beginning, the hypothalamus, the pituitary and the adrenals to slow down that cascade. So those are the three main protocols. Just uh, breathing the essential oil in will interact with all of those different things, which will go right through the body, won't they? So just some experiments I thought you might find interesting. So women who were having um, C-sections, will obviously be very um, anxious and potentially worried about pain. So they were asked to inhale lavender and rose and their perception of pain went down. What we know from experiments is that rose uh, is better than lavender at that. Rose really helps um, pain. And there's lots of experiments that I write about actually in my book, Rose, goddess medicine how they use them in some hospitals to put a little eye patch on children's pillows about 30 centimeters away from their head and just change them every sort of i think it was six hours 
but in all cases, the children's perception of how much pain they were in after their operations was significantly reduced based on this rose oil. Uh, people who were in intensive care because of coronary heart disease were given lavender for 15 days. Not only did they experience less anxiety, but they slept better. There's lots of experiments around um, having bergamot or sweet orange in waiting rooms for um, dentists in particular. They also show the same thing, much more positive feelings about going and sitting in that chair than the people who did not have them. So this one is again a cardiac ward. This time people had lavender and bergamot and ylang, -ylang to smell. And while they didn't it didn't really affect how long they slept, they said that they didn't have to get up to go to the toilet as often because they weren't disturbed by feeling cold. They just felt warmer generally in the hospital environment. And of course, that's, that's much more restful, isn't it? It's horrible, isn't it? I always think my feet feel really cold in hospital, so I need to do that. PMS, PMS is a massive area of research for this. Um, inhaling lavender in one trial helped alleviate um, anxiety and depression. In another one, not only did it reduce their pain, but they didn't bleed as much. I mean, that's a thing in itself, isn't it? So it actually had a styptic effect and stopped the bleeding so strongly. And the trial in yuzu oil showed that the effect happened specifically in the luteal phase. So in the, the biology of it, they... Um, the egg came down and either was fertilized or not fertilized, so not fertilized because it's PMS. And then the egg shell, for want of a better word, breaks down, doesn't it? Becomes a corpus, a corpus luteum and then starts to generate pr um, progesterone. Of course, progesterone can be related to pain. And so the yuzu specifically attacked that to say, calm down. Don't feel as ratty, feel a bit more positive. And the 10 minute in inhalation of yuzu uh, decreased their heart rate um, and stopped the up and downness so that like the rat, <laughs> but also showed that they it, it engaged with the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the bit that should kick in when the saber tooth tiger has gone so that the um, eyes are not so diluted dilated <laughs> and the breathing goes deeper again it's been shallow the heart rate comes down all of that happens because yuzu tells it to and it says uh it significantly decreased three negative subscale uh, subscales tension anxiety anger hostility and fatigue common premenstrual uh symptoms and that was just after one uh, administration of inhalation of yuzu oil, and it lasted for over half an hour. Um, so we will be doing, uh, on my page, I do lots of um, ritual inhalations, I call them. So we do them with the full moon, just engage with an essential oil, each month um, and this month we are doing clarisage and clarisage was shown to reduce levels of cortisol and improve levels of the mood modulator serotonin so that's um, depression and anxiety tied up in a box and then uh, we'll be working with it for an hour just thinking about well actually we're going to be thinking about mercury retrograde um so how our communication might have gone awry but also we may be thinking about uh ways that we can exploit uh mercury retrograde for remembering things we've forgotten to do for business and opportunities we've missed so we've got the physical level here that it's uh, helping cortisol and serotonin. We've got the mental level, which is that it's settling and it's very good for memory. 
but also we've got the spiritual aspect of how it connects with what's going on around us and how we feel uh, within the celestial rain, realm. So I think you'll, um, if you've got like a spiritual dimension to it, you'll really enjoy that this week. Menopausal syndrome. So these women were given a 2% dilution of lavender for 20 minutes for a month. And it was shown that not only do their physical um, and mood symptoms of that syndrome, and we, we say menopause, don't we? But I think of all the things we've got anxiety, we've got depression, we've got mood springs, uh, swings, hot flushes, night sweats, I mean, uh, vaginal dryness, all of it's bad, isn't it? All of that improved from sniffing a 2% dilution. And uh, so I'll have to read this because this never quite goes in. It says another complex trial assessed the effects of lavender on menopausal rats. They became less anxious. And that was accounted for by reduced levels of gonadotropin and ACHT, which is adren adrenocortotrophic hormone, which produces um, cortisol. And FSH and LH, which are gonad datropins which get very high after menopause and these were seen as probably compounding the anxiety symptoms and the improvement was explained by their levels dropping because of the effects of linalool so we can attribute all of that to linalool in lavender so we say oh then we have to do lavender but do we because linalool is in so many other essential oils. So if you don't like lavender, what about going for, well, I'm going to say rosewood, but really I would say don't go for rosewood because we're supposed to be protecting that plant. Um, it's been over harvested. But within that um, rosewood, we're looking at 82 to 95 percent. But what about then ho wood, really sustainable crop? Beautiful smelling thing, 95% ho uh, uh, linalool. How strong an effect do you think that's going to have? Coriander seed, oddly, smells completely different to any of them. Nearly 90% champaka. Beautiful. If you are feeling less than sexy or menopausal, you've got to find the mortgage to pay for it. But champaka, beautiful. Monada, by the opposition, very, very reasonably priced, very, very cheap to buy. And it feels like butterflies are coming out of your head. It's so beautiful. So we've got this beautiful cross section of all of those uh, oils that would have the same effect to help women who were postmenopausal um, or going through menopause, struggling with anxiety, depression, um, vaginal dryness, all of those things start with linalool, sniffing it only sniffing it uh neroli so this is a really lovely article that was published in 2021 um and it was about menopause generally and what it said was that the overriding message was that inhaling the lavender and neroli improves symptoms of menopause and it drew data from another trial which was in 2014 that compared how much do you need? And they used Neroli as their um, benchmark. Would you believe that at 0.1% dilution, there were improvements in the um, hormones? In cortisol levels, cortisol le levels went down, estrogen levels went up, blood pressure came down, sex drive went up, 0.1% dilution, 0.5% uh, dilution was better. So a little bit more, but we don't need to go 20 drops or whatever, we just don't. Um, so I just wanted to talk about oxytocin because oxytocin is a molecule that I'm really interested in. And I think, I can't quite elucidate why it feels like so strongly connected to um, COVID-19 or the, the lockdowns of COVID-19, but oxytocin is our bonding molecule and it goes up when we uh, hold hands, for example, or cuddle people. 
And so the fact that we were doing less of that seems to me we will see, we are likely to see um, alterations within oxytocin. And it's such an important molecule. So my, my favourite clinical trial, I'm sure if you watch lots of my videos, you will have seen me talk about this, was they proved that oxytocin levels go up when we inhale essential oils. They cited 10 oils. None of them will be surprising to you. They were mainly flower oils and wood oils. Um, and all of them improved levels of oxytocin. So oxytocin, we think of usually in terms of its effects on labor and lactation, but it's also involved in orgasm. It's also involved in sleep. It's um, involved in bone density and actually the bone density was how we got to this trial they were trying to find a way to improve women's bone density um, oxytocin naturally drops um, after menopause because it requires um, estrogen to make it so without the estrogen the oxytocin drops and then we have uh, osteoporosis so what they wanted to know was if we can improve levels of oxytocin can we improve bone density in postmenopausal women? And they said, yes. The test showed, yes, it did. So some bright, a bright spark went, well, could we do them with essential oils then? Yes, we can. And so straight away we have this, it's convoluted, but look how big the ramifications of that are. It's also involved in um, obesity. So if there's um, alterations in oxytocin, in many mammals, so humans, but also rats and foxes, and I don't know if it's whales, but maybe it's whales. But if the oxytocin is low, then you'll get obesity as well. And he says recent studies have revealed the administration of oxytocin has beneficial effects on the regulation of body weight, food intake, think about comfort eating, metabolic functions, especially in obese individuals. So what I do is something called aromatology, that we do these ritual inhalations. And this Friday is Friday, the, I don't know, 5th of May, I think. And we'll be doing a ritual inhalation with Clary Sage, but each full moon. And you can find the details of that on my uh, link tree. I update it each month. So if you would like to join us to spend an hour once a month, just thinking about something different as you inhale your essential oil you will undoubtedly feel better we know that because we are going to increase oxytocin we're going to stabilize serotonin by stabilizing serotonin we will also improve GABA GABA reduces anxiety and stress and feelings of fear it is also calming and of course very good for our mood generally we will also interact with the sodium um, ion channels so reducing blood pressure we will reduce blood volume you never know you could even improve your uh, cellulite because it's fluid um but i don't really think i always tell me you've done it um but but certainly acidity um if you suffer from things like um, gastric reflux where stress makes a difference to that we're in we're absolutely in so that is the benefits of inhaling essential oils. Hope it helps.